to How to Deal When the Shit Gets Real podcast. I'm Rietta. And I'm Kami. And today we're here with Jen Taylor. So Jen, how do you deal when shit gets real? Or just tell us a little bit about yourself. I would say wine, but I don't think that's the appropriate answer here. <laughs> oh, I like that answer. That's the first one who's given us the answer of wine. Well, everyone so else is I, I enjoy that. that. So my name is Jen. I am from Toronto, uh, up here in Canada. Um, there's not a lot to say about me. My partner, my boyfriend, Cody, he is a Paralympic athlete for our national team for Team Canada. He plays wheelchair rugby. So get to be a cheerleader all while working my corporate job and kind of balancing life. I I think that also sounds like a pretty sweet life also. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of travel involved. So there's a lot of work on the road, which is always fun and always fun to find like the best Wi-Fi signal. Or terrifying. (laughs) It also sounds like, oh, shit, I have no signal and I need to be on a meeting. You know, that's what comes to my mind. I mean, there is one time where we had a red eye get delayed on like a Sunday night and we were trying to get home and I didn't bring my laptop with me because I was like, oh, I'll be home like Monday morning. And then, like, we got home. My meeting was at 10. We landed at, like, 9. And because, like, we were there, he's the last off the plane. We had to go, like, thankfully, we did carry on. We got our car. I logged in at, like, 10.01. It was nice. Oh, that's but so I lucky. You were a champ. I mean. I try. I was a race <laughs> up to our apartment. I was like, don't even get out of the car. Like, let me out. Give me the keys. And I'm racing up to my meeting. Wow. Oh, that's not the way to start your day either, where you're just in permanent panic mode. Well, and then like, I, I looked like I had just gotten off an airplane. So my coworkers are like, you good? <laughs> That's when the ability to turn off your camera on Zoom is like the best. Right? We're like, I'm not turning it on today, guys. Sorry. <laughs> mm, I never turn on my camera. I'm yeah, I don't Apple. usually. We are always cameras on. Oh, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> anyway, now that we've totally dissed Zoom, so what is it like being an Olympic and Team Canada? Just take us down that road. I don't really think there's like one right answer for that. Like it's, there's, it's something that can you can never be prepared for. I mean, like I had no idea what I was getting into when I got into it. Like Cody and I met in 2020. So like the world was shut down. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of dedication. Like you have to be secure in yourself because he's on the road for up to two weeks every month. And like a lot oh, of that, a I'm lot. not following up. So even like when I do follow him, if he's with the national team, like I'm in my own hotel room, like I'm doing my own thing. I'm eating my own meals by myself. So you have to be so, yeah. So you have to be so independent. And then like, I'm so type A, like I would schedule like my life down to the second for the next, I don't know, 10 years would be ideal. But (laughs) like, you can't do that. Like their schedule doesn't come out that soon. Like I, sometimes I know like a week before that he's getting on a plane for a week. So you have to be flexible. And like, despite the fact that I am so uptight. I am so type A. You kind of just have to work with the cards that you've been dealt and understand like not everyone gets the chance to be on Team Canada. So it really is a blessing in that way. Like not everyone gets the chance to be a Paralympic athlete after they go through a traumatic incident. So you have to look at it that way. And it's kind of nice to have a part. Like I miss him when he's gone and it's nice to be able to miss him. And I'm like, oh, you're not in my hair. Like, <laughs> come home. <laughs> Yep. Was he injured when you already met him? He was early yeah, Paralympic? Yeah, he was injured okay. for, I think he was at the 13-year point when um, I had met him. He was going into his second Paralympics when he when I met him, and now we're getting ready to go into the third. So, so wow. exciting. Yeah, and it's in Paris, so Team Canada. Ooh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know uh, Sarah wanted to go she's like I just want to go that just sounds great go to I'm Paris I'm like manifesting yeah. a spot for her husband on the U.S. team because I'm like you and I we're going to be sitting in the stands together doesn't matter that we're not on the same team like you were going <laughs> that would be awesome yeah I know she said next year well next year that's it, it next year's the Olympic year it's 2024 like yeah. he's got a year to prepare like let's get him on there <laughs> there you go you yeah have the time he could do time. it too i i saw him play rugby and it was awesome and it's he such a terrifying so sport. good it's so scary like i didn't so i never watched it until like we'd been dating like almost a year when he went to tokyo so i was like i'm not gonna watch this like i want to get to know him for him like i'll watch it on my tv when he's in tokyo and then i remember i was watching his first game and it was like 30 seconds in he knocks a guy out of his chair and not like 
I'm like, what wow. is happening? Like, I hadn't looked at the rules. I didn't look at what kind of player he was. Turns out he's a really aggressive player. And I'm just like sitting there with my jaw on the floor. It's 4 a.m. in my time. And I'm like, who are you? Come home. <laughs> so in hockey, that's what they call the goon. So he's yeah, the well, goon. he was a hockey player before. All right, perfect. So he's he's the goon in rugby. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, so I guess we should ask what kind of injury did Cody sustain to lead to him being this amazing Paralympic athlete? Yeah. So Cody is a C6, C7 quadriplegic. Uh, he dove into a shallow lake, which terrible, but I feel like it's pretty common, unfortunately. Yep. That's Mitchell. I so, know. I, we were just talking yeah, about twinsies. that the other day. <laughs> and I was and like, yeah. this episode's going to be coming out soon. So I know I'm so excited for it. Yeah, it's and he's just Friday. he's a C five. So like yeah. the fact that he's a C five and like going this well far in rugby so soon, I'm like, get on it. When I saw him playing, I was like, this is like what he used to do in high school, like in a way, because he was in polo, water polo, and like that's. Like if you were looking from the chest up, all of like the ball and the bashing people, it's the same thing, but in the water for the Never most seen part. Never polo, so that sounds terrible. Oh, really? Like, I thought it was bad on wheelchairs. Like I'm afraid of water, so like you'd see me. Like I'd see you'd be terrified then. Yeah, no, that sounds terrible. <laughs> it just well, yeah. Amazing. When I saw him, I was like, oh, this is Mitchell Hart too, because he did water polo in high school. You were just watching from the chest up. It's the same ball, two nets, you know, and then people like tackling and drowning each other versus being in a wheelchair. It's just, it's like same thing, different like sport. A lot of liability insurance. Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) I just, I'm happy to see how far things have come. My dad's brother actually back in the sixties did the same thing. He dove into a shallow lake and hit his head, but he could not feel anything from the neck down and he didn't survive. But I mean, the medical intervention has come so far So when this first happened, my dad was like, oh, my God, bad memories, flashbacks. So it's just so amazing to hear all these people that sustain a similar type of injury and are doing so well. Yeah, it's crazy. And like, I didn't expect it. And like, quad, like wheelchair rugby, it's all quads or amputees who have like a quad amputee. And I'm like, wow, like, I'm not athletic and I'm (laughs) able-bodied. Like, yeah, I can't throw a ball to save my life. (laughs) That's amazing. I love it. It makes my heart so happy. <laughs> no, it's it's my favorite thing to watch him play. Does he play more than just uh, the rugby? No, <laughs> I don't think our life's ha- like has enough time <laughs> for him to play more <laughs> than just rugby. Like where he's in the gym five days a week. I go with him mm-hmm. one day, sometimes two days a week, just so that our lives are together <laughs> when he's home. And then, like yeah. I said, he's on the road almost two weeks every month. So like right right now we're in off season and off season is coming to an end soon. So I'm just soaking in everything that I can. I was just going to yeah, ask if sure. you went to the, the gym with him and you knew Sometimes I wanted I go to, to know that. Um, they do have, Team Canada has a physiologist who works with the guys here in Toronto. So there's about four of them here in Toronto who train together. The rest are scattered all across Canada. So if he has just like a club practice or like an on-court practice, then I'll come and I'll sit with the other girls and I'll get the gossip. And it's really good because I have that sense of community too, because like they, no one understands what you're going through on a national team, Mm -hmm. except for those other girls. So like, I can talk about it to my girlfriends all I want, but they're like, oh yeah, but like, isn't your life kind of cool? And I'm like, yeah, it's cool, but it's incredibly stressful. Yeah. So having that sense of community, like we're, they're a team, but we're also a team. That's awesome. I relate to you in that aspect because my husband's in the Marine Corps, so he's gone a lot. Um, I kind of, you know, I find the camaraderie among the other wives or the other girlfriends. So I I totally understand what you're saying in that level. Like, kind of just have to find your people and you guys just figure it out together. Yeah. Yeah. You, when you're stuck together, when like we're traveling, we were just in Denmark in October. And like, I traveled with the other girls. I eat dinner with the other girls every night. I sat with the other girls in the stand. So it's like, you really have no choice but to be friends. Yeah. Uh, if you're not friends, I'm sure that that's not going to go very well. I'm pretty sure it would be really <laughs> awkward. I don't want to experience yes. that. And I'm like, every time we get like a new guy in for like club or like his girlfriend or something comes, I'm like, I'm befriending her because like, I need to make sure we're good here. Yeah. Right. So that actually brings uh, us to like the next question. What are some of the challenges you guys have faced? Yeah, I think being apart in general is really hard. So before I met Cody, I was in a really abusive relationship. I got out of that. I had a few months go by and then I met Cody. 
out of the blue, not expecting to meet him. So I was training, I was learning how to let people love me. So I'm like learning how to accept love, but then I'm also having to be super independent because he's on the road. So it's finding that balance between the two. It's like, okay, like, am I super independent and am I hyper independent right now? Or am I going to let love in? And it's Mm -hmm. finding really striking that balance. And it's definitely a balance that I still haven't found. I'm not perfect at all, by all means. And it was learning how to work together. It was learning, okay, like, what can we do when you're on the road to make it feel like more like we're at home together? So what do you guys do? Do you like FaceTime FaceTime a lot? lot. We FaceTime (laughs) a lot. I'm my therapist is like the best at coming up with things. So like before he leaves, we always pick out a book together. And I'm a huge oh. reader. So we pick out a book for me to read together and I'll read this entire book while he's gone. And then when he gets back, I can tell him all about it. So it's still kind of or like, while well, he's gone. I can tell him about what's going on in FaceTime. So it's a really good way for us to stay connected. And then we always do make sure like we've got a date night to look forward to. We spend that time together before he leaves. I try yeah. my best to always drive him to the airport because that's just like, it makes my heart happy being able to send him off myself. I know, right? My So my husband travels a lot for work and he's like, Well, I can just expense a taxi out. And I'm like, no, but I want to drive you. I want to pick you up. And he's like, I appreciate that. But you have a young son. Let me get a taxi. And I'm like, fine. You're right. It's sometimes not very practical because you're (laughs) leaving. So like early or late and it like doesn't mesh with like our son's schedule. Yeah. So I'm like, fine, be practical. <laughs> See, I'm not practical at all. Like I will make it work. And like, I always drive my car to take him to the airport and I drive like the tiniest little car. So like oh. you imagine like a full suitcase, like a wheel bag, a rugby chair, and then like his everyday chair. And I am tetrising it in to my tiny little <laughs> Nissan Versa note. If it's love it. the I last thing I do. And I then I pick him up from the airport and I'm like, I could probably just take his car, but I don't know how to drive it. So I'm going to take my tiny little car for the sake that I'm picking him up. That's so funny. Oh, that's so it. awesome. <laughs> so I've asked you a ton about Cody, but now we need to ask you about you. So you talked about dealing with a cancer diagnosis. So yeah. how did that come about? And yeah, like I guess start with that. I so, won't ask you too many questions at once. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. So I'm officially one year into remission. I just thought I like graduated from oncology, like right before I left for vacation a couple weeks ago. That's wonderful. Woo-hoo! So it's like the best graduation I've ever had. Like forget university. Like I graduated from the oncologist. Um, So I, I mentioned it briefly. So I found out I had cancer in like the strangest way, like the way I was told. So I was actually boarding a flight to Vegas when I got the call. So like, Oh, We're no. going on vacation. Tokyo was finally over after Tokyo. Cody, he just needed some downtime. He was jet lagged. He didn't want to travel right away. So then we booked this vacation. We're like, yes, like we're going to celebrate like happy one year. Like, yes, you just finished Paralympics. And then we're boarding the plane. We're the first aboard. And I get this call from my doctor. And she's like, hey, where are you? And I was like, at the airport. And she's like, well, can you get home? And I was like, well, no, I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> and then she broke the news to me that I did have cervical cancer. And, um, She's like, okay, well, when can you get home? And I was like, in five days when my flight lands again. So oh my God. Man. I had that five hour flight kind of just to process everything, which is really nice. And then I gambled a lot and I will fully admit <laughs> that. <laughs> As you should, like, you're in Vegas. I was like, if I'm going out, I am going out. Yeah, we actually found the cancer out by accident. I had a really bad, I had a health scare earlier this summer before I found out. And they're like, you know what, like, let's just do a one over physical. Like I wasn't due for a pap for another year, but they're like, let's just do one just because. And then I actually got really lucky that they had cho- chosen to do that. And like, now I'm like that person who lectures every girl I meet. I'm like, have you on your pap lately? Like, you should probably go get one. Yes. hundred yep. percent. I had that like leap procedure where like they I just that found too. like, yes. So then after it. that, I was like, yeah, no, definitely never skip your, your uh, pap. That's no, I have sure. nightmares about that one. Like. You're, I don't know if, how it is in the U.S., but, like, you're awake for that. Oh, no, I was asleep. Oh, my, okay. So I, was, I, I was out. No, I was awake. They gave me a shot of freezing, and I literally have nightmares about the smell of burning flesh. Oh, like, God. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, I bet you. I, you know what? I also have heard that um, each doctor does it differently. So mine basically puts you asleep. You get anesthesia. As you should. And then, but my girlfriend had the same thing awake the whole time. And she worked at the doctor's office and said, you could hear girls screaming from the procedure in the office. And I'm like, I, threw How? Up and I would be getting up and walking out. I'd be like, bye. 
<laughs> Why are all these women screaming? Well, and then, so I went for my follow-up appointment and my follow-up appointment was, I think it was like 12 weeks later. And at that point, like I'd finally had like breakdown where I was like, I need mental help right now. Like I am battling. And I had just recently gone on to an antidepressant and I told the nurse that and she goes, oh yeah, that's pretty common within like the first six months of having that procedure done. And I was like, excuse me? What? Like, that's if terrifying. this is traumatizing women that much, why are we doing it? Like, why aren't we putting them asleep for it? Yes. Yeah. I can't imagine being awake for it. Like I said, a year later, I still have nightmares. Like the smell, that's like awful. sometimes I can't do it. Oh man. No. How do you even go in for a regular pap? Like a pap would probably then like freak me out too, because it could lead to the procedure again. I need anxiety medication to go in for it. Oh my gosh. Like, and that's how terrifying. they found the cancer too. That's yeah. Just, wow. No, I don't oh, man. I, like that's one of the things like our healthcare system. Well, it's amazing here. Our women's healthcare it needs such an improvement and our like our between women's healthcare and mental health care here in Canada, I just need such an overhaul. Just because there's so many things that I think can be avoided. There's so much trauma that can be avoided. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. But I feel like America is the same way. Because I, like I said, every doctor does it differently. How do you know you're getting a good How one? do you know what you're you to don't. expect? And I mean, yep. I remember I went in for the procedure and I spent like hours and hours and hours Googling what to expect. And you, no two blogs were the same. Yep. Of course. It's not helpful at all. So anyway, no. I'm sorry. Go back to your story. I, like I totally sidetracked us. Go back. You you processed on the plane and you went and gambled. I went and gambled, and like, drank some wine, went to Nobu. And then we got back and I had to tell my work. So couldn't take a sick day when we got back to go to the oncologist. I had to go to work. So um, went to work, told my bosses. And then two days later, I was at the oncologist for another round of uh, my first round of biopsies. So thankfully at this time, um, Cody, who is a super reserved person, and I don't think he would tell anyone like anything if he didn't have to, um, he had to call his coaches and he was like, hey, this is what's going on. Like, I need some time off to be with her. And they mm -hmm. were so generous. They gave him as much time as he needed. I, of course, shipped him off to a couple training camps, but she came home early for procedures, but we made That's it work so with his job. Sweet. But like the fact that like Team Canada, they're such a family and it's just going back to Team Canada and how like it's literally a family. Like they are your people and they're your people for life. So like when I needed their help, they were there. Like the teams checked in, team checked in on me. Their physiologist stopped by one day after my surgery to just to check in and like bring me cookies. Aww. I, I think, really just think that speaks volumes to their team. Absolutely. It does. Yes, Do you have sure. any advice that you would give to somebody that is handling cancer since you've gone the gamut of it? I think ask for help when you need it. Take time when you need it. I didn't ask for a ton of help. And I definitely like prolonged my recovery because, because of that. Mm. Um, pour yourself a glass of wine because that stuff is a lot to process. Like that is yeah. a big thing to process and find a good therapist. I don't think I'd be alive if I didn't have my therapist. And uh, I, owe, I owe her so much. So did you have to do radiology or uh, chemotherapy or was it just um surgical removing just removing. surgical removement which is so lucky that's that lucky they caught yeah. it that early that's um, amazing wow and then of course they had to like go over like all the risks and like my the biggest thing with me or like the biggest irk for me was they always had to ask is your husband okay with this you might not be able to have kids is your husband okay with this and before they would do everything they wanted to make sure cody consented and i was like first of all he's not my husband yet second of all not his body yeah really. right right it's i never really understood not a that. choice it's really not know, a choice like, it's, i just mm, don't understand cancer or no cancer hmm. well and the fact too is like it was it's covid still like he wasn't allowed into the oncology office so it's not like he was there i'm like do you want right. me to yeah. call him up so he can consent to me having this procedure or do you want to yeah, just, move, do you want to just do? move along here people yeah. i never yeah, understood that's insane. that yeah um but i remember when to... my when my husband and I decided that we weren't going to have any more kids and he was going to get a vasectomy, it was the same thing because we weren't 30 yet. And they grilled us like, well, you're not 30. And are, are you sure? Because this, that, and the other. And it's like, we're married. We've discussed this. We've come to a decision. We've signed the paperwork. Why are we still having this conversation? I just don't understand it. Like you are like the to the government, like you are the most valuable thing while you're in childbearing age. And I'm like, who said I want kids? Mm -hmm. like I don't want cancer yeah 
really. What right. What's more important? Kids are cancer. And, you know, there's many ways to become a parent. Yeah. You, know, you could adopt. You could do. There's a million things to do. There's so many different options. But instead of discussing those with you, they ask, they make sure you're like, is your husband okay with this? And you're like, what does he have to do with this? All yeah, about their really. paperwork, man ridiculous so what do you think your biggest hurdle has been in life and um how did you overcome it I think mental health um I've struggled with mental health since I was little I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety when I was four which I didn't even wow that's really early yeah I I was like I was totally mute like I had like the biggest fear of people (laughs) so I remember there was like one day like the janitor at my school looked at me eye contact with me and then I screamed, peed my pants, and hid in a corner until my parents came and got me. Oh, oh no. Poor thing. Poor so um, I was telling people, to, people are like, how bad is your anxiety? I'm like, well, let me tell you, this is when I was four. <laughs> I haven't really grown out of it much. I feel you. Like, um, I think you're the first other person that I've met. I, but I'm pretty sure I've, I've had it since I was like five or six. So I think you're the first person that I've like talked to that's also like, was that young when you had that realization that you're like, this is not normal. Yeah. And then, I mean, like my life carried on. I was abandoned when I was a teenager. Um, I was being bullied at the time. So like I'm living alone. I'm 14 years old. I'm trying to like parent myself. So you can imagine like the trauma that puts on someone. And then I get into like my first big girl relationship and it was awful, but I stuck it out for five years. So I get out of it. Yeah. So I got out of it. And then I remember being like, who the hell am I? And like, how did I get here? Because I had just been in autopilot for so long, but then people would start getting close to me and I would self-sabotage. And like, I realized like I didn't have any friends because I'm self-sabotaging anyone who tries to get close to me. Even with Cody, like when we first started dating, I'm like, why are you treating me well? Like, get away. Let me ruin this. (laughs) How dare you treat me well? (laughs) And that was exactly it. And he was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you just don't get it yet. But so like, that was such a hurdle. And then like, got to a breaking point where I was like I need to get help with this like I can't keep living my life like this and I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning anymore so I reached out to my doctor first and the first thing she did was like send me over like a mental health assessment and then she I remember her calling me and she was like oh shoot like let's let's fix this so poor thing but I'm glad your doctor finally was like I got you yeah and I'm really lucky that like my doctor could prescribe an antidepressant while I looked for that perfect match with a therapist and then I found that yeah And we've been putting in the work and that work has not been easy. And it's not easy when Cody's on the road two days, like two weeks out of a month. So we're, I'm like putting in all this work, but then all of a sudden I'm alone again. Yeah. (laughs) Breaking this balance and like putting in, implementing all these things. And I'm one of those people, you'll tell me to take deep breaths and I'm going to roll my eyes at you. So I was (laughs) able to find a therapist to explain the science behind everything that she implements. And like, it probably takes her 10 times as long to implement something with me. Cause I'm like, are you sure? And she'll send me like YouTube videos, like proving (laughs) her theories, but that's the kind of therapist you need. Yeah. Good for you. I have to ask what happened to your parents at 14? Um, So my parents split. Um, So my mom was like never emotionally available. Um, I know my mom wanted a boy. (laughs) Oh, so, what? Ouch. sorry to her if she's listening to this, but like, um, yeah, so my mom wanted a boy. So she was always like very emotionally distant. And I think through what I've spoken about with my therapist, that just comes down to generational trauma. So she didn't know how to love something because she was never loved. Um, oh, what my therapist thinks. And I, it allows me to give her a lot more grace. Um, yeah. That's the odd time that we do talk. So my parents split when I was 14. My mom, for some reason, battled for custody of me. And then she met my stepdad within about, I don't know, like three months. And I was moved into my own little apartment. Like they would put food in it. They would do like the bare necessary, um, the bare minimum to make sure that it looked like I was being well taken care of. So like we would show up to church and she would drive me to dance class and cheerleading. But then while you're living alone in your own apartment, that's bizarre. That is really weird. Like pardon my language, but it's effed up. No, (laughs) that is effed up. Like, I have to explain this to people. I'm like, how would you ever do that to your child? Like, you're supposed yeah. to protect me. But right. she didn't know how to be alone. But I wasn't enough for her. So, like, having I, that comes into, like, the trauma. And, like, I had to learn I am enough for people because the one person who I was supposed to be enough for decides she didn't want me. 
And, and why didn't you just leave me with your dad? I don't know. And like, like, my... and why didn't your dad just come and take you and be like, no, you can't leave her in an apartment by herself. So like, I Goodbye. Guess we literally moved, <laughs> we moved, like, we moved to a different province when my parents. Oh, okay. And they did. So he had no power. clue. No, I was so oblivious to all this. And then my dad passed away when I was 22. Oh, oh. no. So it was just like, let's just keep adding to this trauma. And then he passed away and the guy was dating slept over at like another girl's house that night. And I was like, you're being dramatic. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, no, my dad wow. just passed away. If you think I'm being winners. dramatic, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. And I still stayed for another three years after that. Cause I was like, I guess I am being dramatic. Oh my land. Oh, you no. poor thing. Oh yes. You're but well. I've overcome it. I've got a great job now. got a great home and like, now I'm part of Team Canada with Cody. So, like, it's taken a lot of work. And I feel like it's a daily battle. And there are definitely some days where I struggle to get out of bed. And I struggle even in my relationship two years later. And I'm like, are you sure you like me? And he's like, why wouldn't I? Nothing's changed in the past 30 seconds. And it's just one of those things where one day maybe I won't ask him that every five minutes. But yeah. it's never-ending yeah. work. And, like, trauma just doesn't disappear overnight. And that's something that I I've know. had to learn because I am a perfectionist and I've had to battle for everything that I have. But I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I'm not good at getting rid of trauma. <laughs> like, I'm good at everything I try. I'm not good at getting rid of this trauma. You, yeah, because I mean, it's not something that you can just like brush off and like right. clean away. No, you know, it's like, like one I've of learned... those permanent stains that you just have to learn to deal with. You know, and like one of the big things my therapist talks to me about is parts of self. So you can think you're healing yourself, but you have to heal all of these different parts of yourself. So like, you've got like, your inner teenager, your inner child, you've got that inner fighter in you. And all of those parts need separate healing. And you're not going to be healed until you've healed all of those. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And you it already, all just takes time. You've already yeah. come uh, a long way, too. I think that's the other thing that's important for people to remember. We're so always looking at what we haven't done instead yeah. of what we have done. And mm -hmm. you sound like no, you've already I'm done a lot. It's one of those things where I always have to look at myself and be like, you know what? Like five years ago, you would never be here. Like two years ago, I would be like, who the heck do you think you are talking about your mental health publicly? Like that is like something we slide under the rug. <laughs> yeah. Not I here. That that's a lot. Yeah, really not here. And I think that's <laughs> something that's like come out with because of COVID. People yeah. aren't willing to sweep it under the rug anymore because so many people were traumatized by COVID. No, and I, realized how mentally damaged they actually are before COVID even happened. And I think COVID <laughs> allowed people to talk more openly about mental health. Like mental health used to be such a taboo to speak about. And like yes. speaking about your trauma, people are like, oh, I want to hear like the highlight reel. I don't want to hear about the trauma, but your life isn't a highlight reel. And I got so hung yeah. up in that for such a long time where it's like, you know what? Part of healing is being vulnerable. And you're, if you're Absolutely. not being vulnerable, you're probably not healing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think social media has played a part in that too, because it's the same thing. It's nothing but a highlight reel. So then we think we have to live the same highlight reel that we're portraying to everybody else when that's just not realistic. And that's just not it. And then like, I can't say I I post much bad stuff on my social media because I just don't want to be on it. I don't want to be looking at other people's yeah. highlight reels because I think yes. as much as you train your brain not to get in your head about it, like you can still get in your head about it. You're like, oh, wow, like they're on this perfect vacation. Or they're also like, an athlete's wife and they seem so good with it because they're not posting those meltdowns they're not yeah. posting the hard part absolutely yep. yeah right. the hard parts of when you're not able to follow them around and you have to stay home and you can't be there you can't be there or they're like they literally like they have their schedules so rigid like they're on the court they're in a meeting they're in recovery like there's not much time in the day to actually communicate with them and you're having to make the, the best of the little communication that you can have and you really have to learn how to be secure in yourself. Like, I, I used to let it eat me alive. I'd be like, oh, he's not texting me back. Like, I wonder who he's with. And it's like, oh, like, I'd look on his schedule and be like, he's not with another girl. He's just playing rugby. Like, chill out then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you poor thing. I hate, that's the worst feeling when you're like, oh, my God. Oh, wait, no. That's just me over analyzing right now. Yeah. Reel and it it's in. Those, and then you have to, like, be like, okay, like, what's in my coping toolbox? Like, what has my therapist taught me? But not every time do you catch yourself being like, oh, I need a coping tool. Sometimes you just spiral. Yeah, and yeah. a big part of healing I've learned is you're allowed to spiral sometimes. Like you're not always going to have all those tools in your back pocket, but yep. recognizing 
when you do need them is such a big victory. Oh yeah, absolutely. And if you can share some of your tools, cause we always like to share our tools so yeah. that we can give other people maybe a tool that they don't have. What's one of your most helpful tools that you've used? So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the window of tolerance, but everyone has one. So your window mm-hmm. of tolerance is when you're at like a steady state and then different people have different size of windows, depending on what they've been through, just their mental state. So when you learn how to, like, when you start to exit your window is when you start to be irrational. So like, that's when you start to spiral. It's either you're spiraling into like franticness or spiraling into depression. So you're either going up out of your window or down out of your window. So recognizing the size of your window and really learning how to become self-aware of my window has been such a game changer. So, and I know that when I'm out of my window, I can't apply a coping technique because I need to get back into my window. So for me getting back to my window, cold helps me the most because it lowers your uh, heart rate. So I'm like the type of person when I'm spiraling, like I'm going to turn my phone on and blow up your phone with like an angry message. And I'm just like, it won't be rational. So I have an icy eye mask and I will literally go into the freezer. I will grab the eye mask, put cold over my eyes. And if I have cold over my eyes, I can't see the text. And it lowers mm. your heart rate. And then eventually, like, you're just forced to chill out. It's like taking box breaths. So, like, the cold over my eyes has been the biggest game changer. Or if I'm not somewhere where, like, say I'm at work, an ice cube to the wrist. You just need to lower your heart rate somehow to get back into that window of tolerance. This is it's so, so interesting. It's so funny. Yeah, it's so we funny. Were- we just talked to somebody um, who has a lot of mental health issues. And they literally said, Temperature. I go outside and I lower my body temperature because, like, that's one of, like, my, like, starting key moments where I'm losing control is my body temperature literally raises. So it's super funny that it's, like, two episodes back to back are going to yeah. be like, yeah, lower your body temperature, lower, Get back into your window. <laughs> well, she said it was either or. Like, if she's hot, then she gets cold. And if she's already cold, then she'll get hot like take a hot shower so like she does whatever the opposite is to stop the spiral but we've never had anybody talk about temperature before until you two so it's very yes it is very funny yeah but like that's how you but i've never heard of the window thing no everyone has one um i recommend everyone learning about their window because it has changed my life do you do you visualize your window are you like i am a gothic window and it is pretty (laughs) i should i don't do that but i really should but like i'll like now with cody like if I feel myself having like a panic attack, cause I, I have like a way smaller social battery than he does. Like I'm a little, yeah. angry, whereas he's like, he's on a team sport. Like he could talk for hours to people or like someone will be saying something that just triggers my trauma or like my post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll look at him like I'm exiting my window and I think I need to step away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that he knows. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that comes down to communication. Like one thing about his job is you learn how to communicate. Like if you, you have to, because he's gone for two weeks. I mean, like, I don't want a pen pal. Like, he's not my pen pal. He's my partner. And that's one of the things that I always stress people. I'm like, no, like, you have to work because if you don't, you're going to have a pen pal. And that's not going to be a healthy relationship. Yeah. That's a good point. Not wrong. I'm so and intrigued you your... now. <laughs> you're going gonna, to, like, go and you're going to be, like, Googling, like, your window of tolerance and be like, wow, like, what's my trigger? I'm going to have to like like, draw my window. I feel like I need to draw it. Then there's me. I'm like, is my window an octagon? What does my window (laughs) look like? My therapist, like she like shared her screen with me and she like drew like the most like ratchet little window. And she's like, this is your window. And like in my head, I was like, I thought it was going to at least have curtains. (laughs) (laughs) Can we give some curtains to this window, please? I want everybody to just see my window. Well, and that's the thing. I'm like. How am I, um, I'm like, do I hide my window with humor? And she's like, that's exactly how you hide your window. Like your humor are your curtains. Yep. That's exactly how I do it too. Oh, did you say that to your therapist? And if you did, what did she respond? If oh, you remember. She laughs at me a lot. She <laughs> thinks my humor is great. And she's like, you don't have to get rid of your humor. Because I've had therapists who are like, you can't cope with humor. And I'm like, want to walk to me? Because like, I'm going to. <laughs> yes. And then I'm going to fire you. <laughs> But she's like, you know what? I think humor is a good way to cope with things. And she's like, if you're in a moment where like humor is the only coping mechanism that you can pull out of your back pocket, at least it's a coping mechanism. At least it's something. I may need the number of your therapist. (laughs) She has online appointments too. She's great. Highly recommend her to everyone. I love it. That's what will we'll, this podcast will become. And who's your therapist? <laughs> this is how this is how people find their therapist. 
I mean, it's <laughs> not the worst way to find a therapist. I had found my, I literally found mine through Instagram. An influencer I follow went to my therapist and I was like, oh, I'm going to check her out. Turns out she's my perfect match. I love it. See, it was meant to be. There is a it little really bit of out there. It really is hard to find a therapist because <laughs> like, so I like two ways I can go to therapy like one is like it's through it's all through like an app and you just like pick a person yeah. like it's fine and you can just like call them and it's like whatever and then the other way is like through like my insurance and like the insurance it's like there's no face like barely a name there's like no rating there's no review like I have to go and like basically hunt them down on like Facebook and Instagram or whatever to even see if like who is this person? Like, there's like no great information about it, about them. It's just like name, where their like clinic or office is, if they have one. And like, that's it. Like, there's not, there's nothing about them. Like, I have to go on another, like, I have to go on, on like, a, I have to be a PI to find yeah. one on the other place. And then this app that I'm currently using, it just gives you, like, these are all the therapists we think could help you. Okay. And then they build their own profile so that you can, like, see them. And I'm like, okay, this is easier for me. <laughs> because yeah, it's, it's, Google it's so much more clinic. convenient. I don't have to do so much PI investigation. But that, that speaks to the breakdown in our mental health systems. It's like you're doing... Like you're being an FBI agent just to figure out who the heck you're about to talk to. And you're about to share your deepest, darkest secrets with. Like, does that really encourage people to go get help? No. I think that's why why the company that I started working, that I work for now, um, we have over 10,000 providers now. Um, I think that that was our CEO's hope was to make mental health not only easier for the therapist, but for the people looking for it. Because it gives... It tells you everything about them, their degree, where they're located, what kind of therapies they do, what kind of insurances they take. And then it also allows them to basically have their own private practice. So it's a win-win on both sides of the the coin. Oh, I love that so much. Like I literally like saw this girl on Instagram, then I looked at her website and then I like booked online. It was, it was a lot of work. You're like, I like you. Check. (laughs) <laughs> and I felt like it, like it almost felt like I was booking a hair appointment online. Like I was like going through her profile being like, I think I like her work. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's how it should be anyway. Okay. No, because I when I saw these other profiles on like this, basically it's like an app, it's called Lyra that my job has given us because everybody complained about mental health because of COVID. And um, so all of the therapists like, and I was like, mm, nope. Not you. No, no, not you. You're like, like a dating you're app. Too, you're like, you're swipe too. Left. Yeah, I, there basically was. And I like went through all of them and like read them. I'm like, I don't know. Then I picked an old guy. I feel like <laughs> the old guy would be like really cool to talk to you, though. Like, yeah, well, I was like, I was like, you've seen some shit. I'm sure you can help. <laughs> that was exactly it with like my girl. Like, she worked with abused children and then abused women. And I was like, perfect. I've been both of those. You're like, see, th- this is great. You got it cover that's why oh, I was her, I'm like I'm so glad you've worked with abused children and abused women because I'm like the perfect mix and she goes I feel like I'm getting a whole new experience with you <laughs> uh-oh and I'm that's like buckle right. up <laughs> yeah right buckle up buttercup but he also he loves like laughing like he laughs at all my jokes he's like I didn't see it at first but now because like we've only had two sessions he's like I thought you were just being snarky and now I can really tell <laughs> <laughs> that you're using it as a coping mechanism. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, shoot, God, I find some coping mechanisms. You know, yeah, what? at least you were using a coping mechanism. Like, you could have just been like sad and crying in a corner all the time. I can't. Yep. I would be debilitated. Like, yeah. I wouldn't be able to be a person. I don't think I'd be leaving my house. Exactly. It would be me and like, my cats. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd be like, sorry, honey, gotta go. It'd be in this corner. It'd be sad and miserable. Bye. Nice. See you in a week. <laughs> Maybe longer. <laughs> <laughs> Depends how long it's cold outside for. I mean, like the seasonal depression here is real. Oh, oh yeah, yes. absolutely. And it's like, finally getting better here. I think, yeah, it's finally getting better here. And I was in Mexico all week last week. So like, beautiful. Sun and pina coladas fixes everything. Yep. I'm really wishing that our other trip that we have planned for April would be Sunday Pina Coladas, but that'll be in November. It's okay. It's November. That's what matters. It's it's yes. on the calendar. You can look forward to it. Yes. For Mitch and Sarah's wedding. 
I'm go. so excited for them. Are you going? No. I was oh, just okay. in Mexico and we have para Pan Ams. Oh. I just, I booked a little five day trip to, um, or we're looking into booking a little five day trip to Chile. Ooh. Fun. Yeah. I wasn't planning on doing it. And then one of the rugby girls and I started bouncing around the idea and we're like, maybe we'll do this. So like now mm. I'm like, now it's in my head. So now I like keep looking at flights and I'm like, maybe I should just book it. Love it. I mean, it's what's your favorite than, like, trip so far? Like what, what was the favorite place you've been? I love Denmark. We were just in Viola, Denmark, despite their tra- public transportation, their public transportation was terrifying. And if I wasn't with another wife, I probably would have had a meltdown on the train station floor. Um, Why? What was wrong with it? So you know how like you take like a train and it tells you like what platform to go to, what train to get on? No, yeah. it was just like, you kind of had to guess. Uh-oh. And it's not like we That's were taking fun. a short train ride. Like we were taking a two hour train ride. <laughs> so then like, and then like, we, I guess you had to buy a seat, but the person who helped us buy our tickets didn't assign us seats. So every time like more people get on the train, we would get kicked out of our seats. Oh no. But hey, note Denmark to self. Is- Yeah, Denmark is beautiful. I would go back over and over again. And then because we were in Europe, once Cody finished work, we were like, oh, we might as well take a vacation. So we jumped over to Croatia and Croatia has my heart. Um, Ooh. Okay. Note to self. I, Denmark and Sweden are like top of my list. So I'll just have to add from Denmark to Sweden and it's like 45 minutes on the train. See, so I'll have to add Croatian and then I'm good. And that was only like an hour flight. And it was beautiful. The beaches were amazing. The seafood mm. was to die for. And like, I go places to eat. And I ate my way through that country. Love I love it. Wow, you're so tiny. I wish I could eat so much. And I eat, eat like so a much. truck. <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, I wish like, I could. I'm with this like pro athlete who's like training five days a week. And I still out eat him some days. And I'm like, man, I don't even work out. <laughs> That's then, how like, my sister in law is too. And she's as giddy mini like you as well. I talked to my nice. therapist about it though, and she's like, it's because like all the trauma and healing, like it puts your body through like massive calorie burns. Really? So I was like, okay. I need like, to process my trauma more to burn some more too. <laughs> right, right. You need to practice your healing and then boom. Yep. Instead right, of eating then. my healing. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, I see no issues with that either. Give me some cake. <laughs> that'll make me the size of a house. Instead of I'm allergic skinny to little gluten, girl. so I can't eat cake. I say cake, give me some cake, but I'm like, I can't eat gluten anyways. Oh, no. Well, okay, I mean, so okay, ice cream uh, gluten-free. or something. Yeah, you know what? They make some pretty good gluten-free stuff, but I'll stick to some chicken nuggets. There you go. Chicken nuggets, chicken nuggets are, are delicious. Are good. Chicken hey, they made good. some very interesting alternative cakes out there. I just saw one that was a sushi cake, and I'm not going to lie, looked pretty good. I would and be they, all like, over bas- that. They basically like layered seaweed, rice, like the seaweed wrapping, rice, and um, fish. Like, and they just kept doing that. I and that I think there were some vegetables cake. in too. That's a good I idea. Sent it to you over Instagram. I, <laughs> I actually I said my... to my sister in law because she is in love with sushi. I'm like, this I is your kind it. of cake. No, I want that for my birthday cake now. And I'm going to hunt one down in Toronto. Or I'm going to get sure. another one. Make it sushi. too. It shouldn't I'm... be too bad. I'm sure somebody would make it for you. Yes. I'll like put it on an Instagram story. I'd be like, someone, please, please help. Please help. <laughs> I love oh. it. All right. One last fun question, even though this whole interview obviously has been fun. Uh, okay. If you could have a magical power, what would it be? Ooh, invisibility. And not because I'm shy, but because I'm nosy. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yes. It's I like Harry it. Potter, like sneaking around. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Right? Like, I would love that. Oh, my gosh. I'm so nosy. Like, if I were a hairdresser, like, I would have the hardest time not reading my client's texts. And, like, whenever I have a mental breakdown, I say I'm going to go to beauty school and leave finance <laughs> because that's <laughs> how I handle my mental breakdowns. And then I realized I'm like, I would learn so much. I would get so much good gossip being a hairstylist. Oh, yeah. You, I you'd get thinking- the tea. Yeah, you would. My I hairstylist was... knows everything. Trust me. I always me. say, like, I need it. My hairstylist is, like, my second therapist. And, like, I need to make sure I don't yeah. put them on the same week. Because I'm like, that's it's a double therapy session. And that's just really expensive. My <laughs> first hairstylist when I was a teenager was, um a, like, full bore Italian. Like, giant Italian family. You want to talk about not only, like, her knowing everything, like, going on in the town. But, like, everywhere. Because she's got this big Italian family. <laughs> it was the best. 
I love that. See, that's why I want to be invisible. Like, I want to be, like, be able to, like, sneak around and, like, find out all the gossip. And, like, I don't even want to spread the gossip. I just want to know. It's, like, my own personal reality show. <laughs> Would you do it at work? I imagine you sneaking around at work being like, what's everybody? Who's talking I, I, about right who? Now I work with all boys, so I really don't want to hear their conversations. I'd be like, oh, yeah. hey, talk. no, those Probably guys, not. guys are, like, even from my husband's work, I'm like, you guys are a bunch of girls. Are they like, see my I, guys just locker room talk? Like they'll be like, oh, looked up this girl on LinkedIn. And I'm like, ew. No, like these guys, I swear to gosh, they call each other to like bitch moan and complain about the other guys that work. I'm like, you guys are all girls. I cannot believe you just spent an hour talking to your coworker, talking smack about another coworker. You guys are girls. Well, now I want to be a fly <laughs> on the wall for like a group of guys gossiping like women. That would be amazing. I no, feel seriously? like you just have to go to my husband's work because like you guys are all girls and like they'll have mul- like he'll have multiple phone conversations with like a couple of guys that he's buddies with and they're all shit talking the other like this other girl that works there that doesn't know how to do her job and this other guy that's like trying to like get this other guy fired it's like oh I love it I don't even Forget know but office. it's like I'm like, like you guys are life. a bunch of old biddies <laughs> get off the phone leave this kind of talk to the women this is weird I, I feel don't know like shit talk as well as we do either which is like the bad thing yeah that's weird I feel like a fire department would be like that I feel like they'd be talking shit about like everything like do you believe that lady that we had to put in the ambulance earlier she <laughs> there was nothing wrong with her oh I'm positive <laughs> that it is like that because my brother-in-law was an emt and it was 110 percent like that and like from mitchell and my dad oh yeah fire departments is exactly like that yes, it's I mean, all yeah, the shit to like a real life like a real housewives but like fire department version yes oh See? i'm sure it's like that jen's just gonna sneak around and get the tea for all of us and then we'll all sit down with wine and hear about it i would be honored like send <laughs> give me a glass of wine and i will gossip about anything for hours <laughs> i love it <laughs> it's great All right. Well, I think this concludes. Thank you for uh, being on our podcast. And this is how to deal when shit gets real. And we'll see you all next episode. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you.